Good morning, everyone. I'm so pleased that there are so many people who are prompt this early on a Monday morning. Welcome to the 2021-2022 Hess Scholar in Residence Week featuring Yale professor Lisa Lowe. I'm Rosamond S. King, and I'm the director of the Ethel R. Wolf Institute for the Humanities, which organizes and coordinates the Hess Week with the, with the wonderful contribution of professors and students and staff from across Brooklyn College. We are pleased that the president of Brooklyn College has joined us to kick off this week. And without further ado, I would like to introduce Michelle J. Anderson, the 10th president of Brooklyn College. Thank you so much, Professor King. Good morning and welcome everyone. I am so excited to be here. This is always one of my favorite weeks of events at the college. Uh, this is the second year that the Robert L. Hess Scholar in Residence Lecture Series is being held online. And I really appreciate the extra effort that folks have gone, have had to engage in, in order to ensure that we can all meet virtually. So thank you for that. And to continue this great tradition of uh, the uh, Hess Week, despite the challenges that we face. This annual lecture and Scholar in Residence Series is possible because of the Hess's families ongoing gift via an endowment in honor, in honor of former Brooklyn College President Hess. The Ethel R. Wolf Institute has honored Professor Hess's vision by consistently bringing top scholars to enrich the academic and cultural life of the campus. This year's Robert L. Hess Scholar in Residence is Lisa Lowe, as you know, the Samuel Knight Professor of American Studies at Yale University, who I wanna to welcome to the virtual world of Brooklyn College. Professor Lowe is the first Asian American Hess Scholar, and this is timely and important given the interest we have at the college in formalizing an Asian American studies program on campus. I wanna, pro I, I wanna thank uh, Professor King, the director of the Wolf Institute and the many staff and faculty members, including Wolf Administrator, Anthony Bianco, who I was on uh, email with multiple times this morning. He's terrifically responsive and helpful. I also wanna thank the Wolf Administrator, um, I'm sorry, the Wolf Faculty Fellow, Lauren Mancia, for all their efforts in organizing this morning's event, as well as the entire week-long series to come. I also particularly wanna thank sociology professor, Yung Yi Diana Pan, who leads the Asian American Studies Working Group here and the Asian American Faculty and Staff Organization, whose work was instrumental in planning this event and the week's programs. Uh, the Wolf Institute is a center that is embraced by the entire Brooklyn College community. It's a hub of scholarly activity. And this is some of the, this is the centerpiece of, of a lot of the scholarly activity that the Wolf Institute engages in. We greatly appreciate the existence of the Wolf Institute and the Hess family for helping us to have this program today. I wanna to thank everyone for coming together online to celebrate and honor Lisa Lowe and the other terrific panelists that will be introduced shortly to you. Uh, and I will turn it back over now to Rosamond King. Thank you, Professor King. Thank you so much for being here, President Anderson. We appreciate it. Kenneth Gould, who is the Dean of Brooklyn College's School of Humanities and Social Sciences, has modeled leadership by providing a thoughtful land acknowledgement before each of his meetings. The Wolf Institute is following that example, and we begin our largest event of the year, the Hess Week, and the largest intellectual event on our campus with a land acknowledgement by indigenous elder and lifelong New Yorker, Mr. George Stonefish. As with all of our speakers, a detailed bio for Mr. Stonefish is available online, and that will go into the chat. Um, so I will just say that we are truly fortunate to have this activist and artist here with us to celebrate the opening of our Hess Week. Mr. Stonefish. Well, thank you for uh, the invitation. I feel honored to be uh, part of this. I was part of all your Hess Week last year, and hopefully this becomes a tradition. Um, I, I really think this progress that's being made amongst the academia in New York City specifically of uh, honoring the Lenape uh, before their major events, graduations, et cetera, is a step in the right direction. Because as a Lenape, and growing up here in the city, I was always the unknown quantity. You know, people would ask, or I would ask people, well, what Indians met the uh, Dutch and the English and all of the explorers that came to this part of the Turtle Island? And none of them would know. 
None of them would know that it was the Lenape people that provided the first uh, uh, sustenance and so forth for your explorers, for your colonizers, for all of you that came to this land. We are the ones that were responsible for them surviving those first harsh winters after they landed with no stores left, without the uh, understanding of what a potato was. I mean, there are many things that are here that were totally alien to the European and only through their participation here and us teaching, the Lenape teaching them how to grow the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash, um, how to hunt and what animals they could eat and couldn't eat. Um, we enabled them to survive and we enabled them to establish colonies here, establish settlements, which began to thrive throughout time. And one of the things that we shared with them, although we did not share a religion, we have a way of life that we call it as opposed to a religion because it's all encompassing. It involves every single waking moment of our existence. And so that you understand how we do things. Whenever we come together in a group of people, uh, we, during certain times of the years, we always do an opening or it's a prayer. And when we pray, I'm going to say it in English because I think the important thing is I could rattle off a bunch of Lenape for you, but you wouldn't understand it. You would miss the point of it. And the point I want you to take is I'll explain after and see if you can find out what makes our prayers unique. Creator, I'd like to give thanks for the stars, moon, and those in the heavens that provide guidance to us and to the animals and tell them when the seasons are changing and what they should be doing and how they should continue to follow the instructions that's handed down by you, the creator. I'd also like to give thanks to the winged creatures that fly to and fro, that with their feathers provide for ceremony, with their meat provide sustenance, and also provide guidance to their uh, brothers and, and, and sisters or other winged creatures and, and their four legged in terms of what time of the year it is and, and uh, what they should be doing and their responsibilities as they follow your instructions as handed down by the Creator. I'd also like to give thanks for the trees and the, the brush that covers and protects Mother, or Mother Earth, or as we call it, Turtle Island because this allows for the uh, uh, soil to remain in place to grow. This allows for the, uh, uh, the, the, the protection of Turtle Island so that it continues to follow its instructions as handed down by the creator. I'd then like to give thanks to the four-legged creatures who go and who are willing to give up their lives to provide their skins and furs to us to protect ourselves, to provide their their flesh to, for our sustenance, or even to provide their bones for implements and tools which we make. So because we never, uh, we never fail to use every component of the body of, the, of what we take and what we give thanks for. And we give thanks that they continue to follow their instructions as handed down by the Creator. We also like to give thanks to the, four, the three sisters, uh, corn, bean, and squash, which we have learned by following your directions, Creator, to plant them together in one plot so that the, the, they, they, they help each other. One provides for uh, the soil to, to enrich it. Another prevents pestilence and insects from eating. And the other provides a stem for which the other is to grow and to climb. And working together, we great great crops out of that. And, and they continue to follow their instructions as handed down by the Creator. And if I have forgotten to mention anything because of my young age, I'm going to leave a moment of silence for all of you in your own minds to think of that and to give thanks. Finally, I'd like to give thanks for everybody who is here because they continue to follow their instructions as given by the Creator, to learn about other cultures, 
to relate and to communicate with each other so that we can live together on this turtle island. And I thank them all for continuing to follow their instructions as handed down by the Creator. Now, the one thing that you'll notice in this prayer is at no time did I ask for anything because that's not our way. Our belief is if you live your life in the appropriate way, if you do what is right by maintaining respect for yourself, your nuclear family, your clan, your nation, your confederacy, and for those people who reside around you, if you live your life in the right way, you don't have to ask for anything, but it will come to you. Because that is the way that the creator will reward you for living and doing the right things. So I think that's a major difference in the way that our prayers are done. And that brings to the whole concept of respect. Because when I was young, I couldn't understand, especially since I grew up during the civil rights movement, while all of these people were demonstrating and going to these towns in the South and so forth and making issues with things and, and fighting with the police, why us as native people, why did we only take up arms when people invite, invaded our small Negro territories that we still hold? And when I went to the elders, they said, because we live our lives according to one term and it's, happens with all native people on this turtle island that they all believe in and embrace this term of respect and as long as we continue to do this this is the reason why all of the stuff that has been done to us the boarding school the attempts to take our language to, to uh, um, take our hair and to, uh, try to make us into um, the american dream why we were still able to survive with our culture and our traditions intact, and why they are coming back stronger now when our young and our old are transferring that knowledge, and why we still have our councils, where I, as a turtle, sit with the turtle clan when we decide matters of import for our nation. And all of these things that have allowed us to survive and to be considered indigenous people or the First Nation people of this Turtle Island are all accounted for because of the way that we have lived our lives and that we respect the rights of others. And we don't believe in making war on people outside of our territories, but we will pick up arms to defend the territories that we do hold. And that is our responsibility. And because we as Lenape people come from a society in which we are matriarchal. Our women are our leaders. They are the ones that select our chiefs. We have no hereditary chiefs, contrary to Hollywood's beliefs. But we have people who are selected because of their good heart and good nature, and who are willing to give up all of their wealth so that they can represent the clan from which they are part of. And in our councils, we have three different clans, like the houses, of the uh, uh, constitutional government in which decisions are made in, within the clan and then discussed between the different clans until there is a meeting of minds and then it becomes law for the, for the nation. Now this has all been in place prior to the arrival of the European and still is in place today because we still have these councils on our tribal lands. And as a result, I, as a grandfather who was raised in New York City, surprisingly on the Upper East Side of all places, I have maintained my tradition because when I was young, although I was raised on the Upper East Side, my mother would send me home to my grandparents where I would learn tradition, song, dance, and so forth. So I grew up with a duality of understanding. And because I have had this, I have passed this down to my children, to my grandchildren, and I'm now passing it on to my great grandchildren because we as Lenape people, one, understand our responsibility to Turtle Island and we will continue to fight for its protection, fight against 
the insipious things that are done to it in, in mining and, and drilling and so forth for the benefit and greed of these people who have no understanding of the respect they must give to its brothers and sisters that surround them. And this land acknowledgement, I think, is good because this is a step in the right direction for us all to understand the importance of this land. And to close out very briefly, I must sing you an honor song for all of you that have come here today. Thank you for the honor and, and giving me the opportunity to share a little bit about our beliefs and our culture with you. It does me proud to know that all of you are willing to listen to what we have to say. And with this, I turn it back over to Rosamond. Thank you so much, yeah. Mr. Stonefish. It's our honor to have you with us. And I was particularly struck by your comment that you felt that Indigenous peoples were an unknown quantity when you were growing up. And as an educational institution in general, Brooklyn College, and I think also the Hess Week in particular, and what the Wolf Institute tries to do is make sure that we are not unknown quantities to each other. And this week, I think, is an opportunity for all of us to have engaging conversations through deep engagement with a single scholar's work. Placing Lisa Lowe's residency within the context of Brooklyn, we think it's appropriate to follow our indigenous land acknowledgement with a kind of context acknowledgement. This is the beginning of our opportunity to explore the global of the title, meaning the, the global and combined local experience of Asian Americans and Asians in Brooklyn. And to begin that exploration, we are happy to welcome Asian American elder, Reverend Samuel Wong to share a few words with us. Greeting to everyone. Thanks, Professor King. Let me share my story. Uh, my name is Samuel, Dr. Samuel Wong, and I'm the senior pastor of the Chinese Thomas Baptist Church in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. My wife, Kelly, and I have been a part of the Brooklyn community since we immigrated to the United States from Hong Kong in 1982. In the earlier days of Chinese immigrating to New York, most of the population settled in what we know today as the Manhattan Chinatown. Later, due to job requirements, the population slowly dispersed into the neighborhoods in the outer boroughs, one of which was Sunset Park, Brooklyn. Some may wonder why Sunset Park? First, Convenient. It's convenient for them to travel to Manhattan from Sunset Park to Manhattan only half an hour and the train no transfer. Second, the rental price in Sunset Park were cheaper compared to those in Manhattan or Queens. There were more 
option, and therefore immigrants can afford them. Third, this was uh, amazing. Superstition. In the Chinese language, eight, ba, has a similar pronunciation with the word fa, which means wealth or fortune. A number very welcome almost the Chinese people. Everybody wants to become rich. That's why they gather mainly in 8th Avenue. Their logic was, if they can live on the rich avenue, they do will become rich one day. As the Chinese population grew, so did the land value of the commercial district in the mountain Chinatown. Factory were forced to move out of the area and business began investing in Sunset Park. Approximately when my family moved here in 1982, for them, there were few reasons to consider Sunset Park. First, the area was already saturated with rich human resources. Many of the labor that previously traveled into the Madden factory already lived in the area. Second, there was no need to unionize in order to open garment factory. At that time, there were more than 30 factory, large and small, are already located in the area and the number continue to grow. Lastly, as more immigrants live and work in the area, there was a growing demand for shopping and dining, business like Chinese grocery store, restaurant, laundromat, just to name a few. Begin opening along 8th Avenue between 50th and 60th Street. The essential needs were all located with the area. And it was believed that this community would one day become New York City's third Chinatown. God gave my wife and I have a vision to spread the gospel in this specific community. Through much prayer and search, we began looking for a location in the 8th Avenue. Finally, we start the church at 52nd Street. How we can help them host weekly English class. Second, vacation Bible school every summer. Third, we have some concert. Fourth, we have the host the summer street fair every Labor Day Saturday. So we block 50 seconds to 60, and then we hold the street four and let more people enjoy. In the 2004, the Fujianese speaking immigrant have moved from the Manhattan can Chinatown into, the, into our community. Therefore, the people group that we serve dramatically changed from a primary Cantonese speaking congregation to a Fujianese one. As we met them, we saw a great need for the caring and sharing the gospel from the church. You may be sitting here wondering why I am giving you a condensed history lesson on the evolution of the Brooklyn Chinatown. Well, I want to share what I have learned over the years as a community leader. My design is to improve the quality of life of those I serve. Location may change. People grow we serve may change. The language may change. The basic need remain the same. My goal is to spread the good news to as many as possible and my heart for the Chinese speaking immigrant. I've learned that until they know you care and that the basic needs are met, they do not have the capacity for more. Aiding them in the assimilation of their new life open the door for personal connection. Inviting other organizations to come alongside, expand the network, 
and the resources, which in turn frees up your time and capacity. As the community grows and frees, the responsibility of the leader does as well. As more familiars move into the area, there's a greater need for the improvement to existing in fact, structures. To name a few, there is a need for more school for the growing number of children, affordable housing, and more extensive transportation system to connect the community to the rest of the Brooklyn and to the city. As a leader, it is about advocating for those who does not yet have a voice. It is about meeting the need of the people. It's about partnering with other and connecting the different parties. It's about building a foundation that lasts and that people trust. Thank you again for having me today to share my story. Thanks. Thank you so much, Reverend Wong, Reverend Dr. Wong, for sharing that. You know, I learned something about 8th Avenue that probably the rest of you, or some of you on this call, were learning as well. And I'll share something since we have right now we have the chat disabled, we're going to enable it for the QA. In the meantime, if you haven't seen this before on Zoom, this is how you can kind of applaud for people. Or you can, if you know how to use your little reactions, you can put the little kind of claps in the corner as we're going along. Um, you know, I really appreciate too often when people think about Asian Americans in New York City, they only think about Manhattan's Chinatown, right? And that's why we wanted Reverend Wong to speak as well. At Brooklyn College, where, you know, depending on how you count it, between 25 and 40% of our students represent the breadth of East, West, and South Asia, we know that the reality of Asian American experiences in New York is so much more diverse than just Manhattan's Chinatown. So to continue that conversation, I want to welcome historian and Swarthmore professor Vivian Trong to tell us more about Brooklyn Asian American experiences and activism. Thank you so much, Professor King, and thank you to the Wolf Institute for having me here today. Um, I'm really honored to be on this esteemed panel, and um, I'm also someone who was born and raised in Brooklyn, so coming home, um, even if it's on Zoom, always is really wonderful for me. Um, so for today, I'm going to be uh, following up on some of uh, Reverend Wong's remarks. Um, focusing on uh, Asian immigrant experiences in another uh, center of Asian immigrant um, community in Brooklyn, in, um, in Sheepshead Bay and in Bensonhurst in the 1980s and 1990s, focusing specifically on how these populations were uh, being policed and faced racial violence um, in this era. Um, so I'm going to... Um, Try and share my screen. Okay, so it looks like um, I'm not able to actually do that right now, but um, maybe you can just talk through some of my comments um, and, um, and share my talk that way. Um, so as I uh, was mentioning, um, I am focusing on the 1980s and 1990s in Bensonhurst and Sheepshead Bay in Southern Brooklyn um, and uh, making the connections between a segregationist campaign in the 1980s and police violence in the 1990s. Uh, so over the past year in particular, um, some have called for more policing as a response um, to the hate crimes and racial violence that uh, we've been seeing against Asian Americans in um, the era of COVID-19. Um, but what I want to show through this talk today is that hate crimes and policing are a part of a spectrum of racial violence um, that have faced Asian Americans for decades. So for this talk in particular, I'll be um, drawing from uh, the archives of the grassroots organization, CAV Organizing Asian Communities, which um, was founded as the Committee Against uh, Anti-Asian Violence. 
Um, so just to go over some um, demographic context. So uh, the 1980s um, is really this moment when New York City becomes a majority minority city for the first time. And this is also the moment when the Asian American population in the city is doubling. Um, and in particular, in some neighborhoods like Bensonhurst and Sheepshead Bay, these are neighborhoods that before the 1980s were almost entirely white. And in the 1980s and 1990s is when you see a shift in uh, the Asian American population um, in the population of these neighborhoods to include more um, Asian American residents who are moving in. Um, in uh, the 1980s, the growth of this Asian immigrant population precipitates um, backlash um, by some of the white residents in, um, in Bensonhurst and Sheepshead Bay. So in 1987, there was the distribution of uh, thousands of flyers across these neighborhoods in southern Brooklyn. Um, that accused uh, Chinese and Korean residents who are moving into these areas of a complete takeover of these neighborhoods. Uh, they accused Chinese immigrants of being drug dealers and portrayed uh, Korean immigrants as uh, being part uh, of the um, Mooney's religious organization. And um, in addition to the distribution of these flyers, there were uh, reports of physical assaults, uh, vandalism, the boycotts of Chinese and Korean businesses. Okay. So um, in response to the distribution of these flyers and um, these various instances of uh, racial violence, the city under, under the administration of uh, Mayor Ed Koch refused to support even these nominal efforts toward uh, what community leaders and activists called uh, racial harmony programs. Um, so for example, in response to a local high school student's request for funding, um, Koch stated, quote, there is a limit to what the city can do. You have to find it in yourselves to start these programs. So in many ways, there was this um, abandonment of um, these communities and um, unsurprisingly, racial violence continued to happen in Southern Brooklyn. So one of the most famous cases that occurred in this decade um, occurred in 1989 against a black teenager, Yusuf Hawk Hawkins, who was shot and killed by white youth in Bensonhurst. So in the 1980s, you see this um, era of backlash against the changing demographics of the city as it's becoming majority minority and uh, this backlash against the integration of white neighborhoods. Um, so moving to the 1990s, um, this is um, during the Giuliani era, um, the police were empowered to enact what geographer Neil Smith has called uh, revanchist policing. So Smith wrote that uh, communities of color were, quote, excoriated for having stolen New York from a white middle class that sees the city as its birthright, end quote. Um, so in this era from um, 1995 to 2001, uh, there are increased reports of police violence across the city, um, including Chinese Americans in Southern Brooklyn. Um, so in 1995 and 1996, there were multiple cases in Southern Brooklyn um, that, uh, in which police, viol police violence occurred against Asian women in particular. And um, the police were called for issues um, such as uh, landlord tenant disputes. And when they arrived on the scene, um, the women were beaten, arrested, and often called slurs. Um, so some of the um, things that uh, the women who experienced these uh, cases reported the police saying was, uh, you Chinese animals come to Brooklyn and take all the houses. Um, so, you know, this continuity with um, some of the, um, the segregationist uh, rhetoric of the 1980s um, of this idea of a takeover by Chinese and Korean immigrants. Um, so this is, um, you know, the, an example of uh, the ways that policing in the 1990s was in, um, in some ways continuous with segregationist violence that happened in the 1980s. Um, so, um, 
one of the major cases of police killings that happened in the Giuliani era was of a 16 year old um, Chinese American um, Yongshin Huang, who was playing in a friend's backyard in Sheepshead Bay on March 24th, 1995. Uh, he was playing uh, with a BB gun uh, with his friends when a neighbor called the police because they believed um, the toy gun was real. And when the police arrived, um, Officer Stephen Mizrahi shot Yongshin Huang in the back of the head. So this is one of many cases of police violence in the 1990s. Um, Yongshin Huang's mother and sister organized alongside Black and Latinx family members who also lo lost loved ones to police brutality. Um, so the, the Huang story um, may sound uh, familiar in some ways to us today. Um, the officer was never indicted and the family um, settled with the city for $400,000. Um, I wanted to end uh, by talking about uh, a protest that happened shortly after uh, the death of Yongshin Huang. So and on uh, April 25th, 1995, um, the, this was the day before Giuliani would announce a budget that would leave the de uh, police department's funding essentially untouched uh, while cutting social services like healthcare, education, um, employment, and housing. And uh, organizations uh, across communities and across um, issues gathered to organize a protest uh, during rush hour um, in New York City. So um, organizations like CAV Organizing Asian Communities, uh, the National Congress for Puerto Rican Rights, um, ACT UP, um, and uh, organizations representing um, uh, homeless New Yorkers, um, all gathered to stop traffic at four um, different bridges and tunnels, um, the Brooklyn Bridge, the Manhattan Bridge, Queens Midtown Tunnel, and ba uh, Brooklyn Battery Tunnel, um, and each site would represent a different struggle. So at the Manhattan Bridge, uh, CAV and the National Congress for Puerto Rican Rights protested police brutality uh, with the families of those who lost loved ones to police violence. Um, other organizations also protested uh, the lack of city funding for healthcare, uh, CUNY students protested cuts to public education, homeless advocates fought for jobs and housing. Um, so in response to the segregationist violence in the 1980s and police violence in the 1990s uh, that attempted to remove people of color from neighborhoods like Bensonhurst and Sheepshead Bay, activists claimed um, the city is ours. So that was their, their slogan during this protest, the city is ours. So I really see this as a, in many ways, as a, a predecessor to um, the movements today to defund the police and the uh, city budget. So the debates over the city budget, the idea that uh, budgets are moral documents and that funding should go to education, housing, um, employment, and social services that prevent harm uh, rather than um, punitive responses to crime. Um, so in conclusion, we know that uh, violence against Asian Americans is not new and neither are community organizing efforts and response. Uh, the example of Southern Brooklyn shows how policing is part of a spectrum of violence that Asian Americans have faced. Um, and in the 1980s and 1990s, we see examples of Asian Americans responding um, in ways that built movements with other communities of color. Thank you and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Professor Trong. I think, you know, to echo your last comments, I really appreciate your sharing the long history, not only of anti-Asian violence and racism in our communities, but also talking about Asian American activism and agency. So I imagine your question and comments are getting ready. And we just have two speakers left. Um, I'd like to welcome now a Brooklyn College alumna to speak. And again, you can read more about her online, but Professor Zora Syed is a longtime Brooklyn resident, a, re a writer and a scholar who is returning to Brooklyn today, as Brooklyn College today, as she's also returning to CUNY as a professor. Welcome, Professor Syed. Hi. Um... Let me look at this. Um, hi, uh, it's so happy to be here. That conversation was, um, the talk was so excellent about history of Brooklyn because I was at the CUNY protests as a student and I remember how violent they were uh, and the police were uh, not only pepper spraying students, but um, like 
it was just very abusive. It was one of the most uh, frightening kind of protests I'd ever been to. So uh, thank you for that history. Uh, I did grow up in Cheapside Bay. Now that I'm looking at my my talk, it feels sugar-coated. I didn't talk anything about, I didn't talk about the Islamophobia that we had to deal with um, in Cheapside Bay. Uh, but I will talk about the food history uh, in Southern Brooklyn and uh, my own uh, family's experiences here. Um, so it's called Samsa in Sheepshead Bay, and I will be reading, but um, I hope you don't mind too much. Uh, in southern Brooklyn, at the very tip of the borough where the beaches are the main attraction, runs Ocean Avenue. Along this long street, which begins on Emmons Avenue and ends near Prospect Park, is a long stretch of apartments, which in the 1980s were managed by Turks, Tatars, and Uzbeks. The buildings were hardly six stories high and nearly identical, distinguishable only by a few shades of brick, yellow, or red. My childhood was spent zipping from one building to the next, playing in the basements with reckless, the reckless freedom of childhood. My friends were the children of the supers who lived and worked in these apartments, so we were able to sneak in through all the nooks and crannies, playing hide and seek, and even crawling into the large dryers in the basements. Not so safe. The thread that held us together around the neighborhoods and in school was the Turkic languages, Tatar, Uzbek, Kazakh, and Turkish, but sometimes equally important uh, bound us together, which is Turkic food. The memory of my childhood is filled with an abundance of smells and tastes amid moored boats and seagulls that flew in a flurry above our heads. The most memorable is the taste of minced lamb tucked into dough and baked as samsa or fried as bolani. How can I ever forget Emmons Avenue in autumn, the view of the bay on a sunny day, a thermos of steaming black tea with cardamom sweetened for the small family trips. Cupped in our warm hands, these treats simply melted in our mouths. The mini savory pies were celebratory foods, making them required uh, all hands on, on deck. These labor-intensive meals were prepared by groups of women who gathered before special events such as picnics or holidays. Together they painstakingly knotted the pastry, the Uzbek term for wrapping dumplings or other filled pastries. In the Uzbek household, the fundamental meal is a rice dish known as osh or palau or pilaf or pilaf as more familiarly known in the West. Uh, variations of the palau traveled to India with the Mughals and became biryani, which means fried in Farsi, just as korma is kawarma, which means fried in Turkic. Kawarma was then taken as korma, gourmet in Iranian Farsi and turned finally by the French into gourmet. Given this etymological lineage, how can korma not taste delicious? Lamb is the main protein on the Central Asian table. The meat is steamed, broiled, grilled, stewed, and tucked into pastry dough, and either baked to form samsa or fried to make chibarek or bulani. Beef makes an appearance in noodle soups like lahman, but rarely. Chicken, although present in roasts or kebabs, is not nearly as popular as lamb. Central Asian cuisine is a gastronom gastronomic testimony of a nomadic past, which is why there is such an abundance of lamb, goat, dairy, mostly yogurt, briny cheese, sausages, and dried meat. Lamb is famously made into shish kebabs and grilled on an open wood fire. The origins of shish kebab is shush kebab, a Farsi term that means lungs roasted. Lungs salted, skewered, and roasted in an open fire was a quick meal, and on the uh, long mountains and on the, oh, it was a quick meal. Uh, the popular term used by Russians and Turks is shashlik, which comes from uh, a Turkic origin means hurried uh, or fast food, while others argue that it is a variation of sihlik, which means with a stick. Vegetables are a rarity in Central Asian diet. The national fruit is the melon, known as kharbuza, which means donkey goat in Farsi. The story behind the kharbuza is that only after a donkey and goat ate the melons did the king see it fit for the people to eat the fruit. Um, the other national fruit is watermelon, or tarbuz, a variation of the kharbuza, which translates into more humorously the literal wet goat. The joke is that even our fruits are named after animals. 
So kaze or horse meat is made into sausages, a specialty among Turkic people. Even though the meat is considered taboo according to Islamic food laws, the Uzbeks allowed themselves some flexibility by slaughtering hurt horses according to halal rules, rendering the meat permissible. Other religious Uzbeks made uh, qaza passable in the Muslim Uzbek diet by telling a folk story that grants permission through makru, a religious concept that allows for a gray area in Islamic law. Makru permits some flexibility for eating animals such as rabbits and even chickens sometimes. This flexibility, though, is not tolerated in countries like Saudi Arabia, where Uzbek immigrants caught preparing horse meat were deported. Um, Uzbeks were referred to as donkey eaters uh, because of in Afghanistan because of the rumor that Uzbeks make sausage, uh, which was unfamiliar to Afghans who uh, prefer their meat dried. Um, Khaza is considered an ideal meat for winter, uh, and it's because of this medicinal uh, claim that it's permissible. Although really, when we trace it back, it comes from the Mongols for us. Um, let's see. So I always love this because this is stories my father told me and my grandfather, my um, my aunties told me about the food. Uh, since Sheepshead Bay has become such a great uh, spot for Uzbek food, Nargis and some of the others being really popular, um, some of the background is I think a lot of fun as well. Uh, the addition of potatoes in the Uzbek diet has an indirect uh, connection to the Civil War in America, during which cotton was not exported to Europe. The shortage of cotton led to the Russian conquest of Tashkent, 1865, Samarkand, Bukhara, 1868, and Khiva in 1873. To satisfy the need for cotton, cotton fields replaced wheat fields, and this is especially true under um, the five-year plan of Stalin. Uh, so to make up for the lack of wheat, the government sent train cars filled with the New World tuber, which uh, looked like rocks to, um, to Uzbeks then. Um, my grandfather once recalled how the people at first thought the khatichka, which is how you say it in Uzbek or older Uzbek, were rocks that the Russians had brought to sh throw at the people. Uh, this is perhaps why the word for potato in Uzbek is an alteration of kartushka, the Russian term. Uh, today, the people of post-Soviet Uzbekistan refer to potatoes by the proper Russian term, kartoshka, but for Uzbeks in the diaspora who migrated after the 1920s, they still use khatichka, which always sounded like khadija, said quickly, and so I grew up thinking the potato was named after a woman. So let me move down. Okay. Um, just going to skip over to from foods. Oh, here, I think we should talk about mantu since it's become quite popular. Um, the Uzbek version of mantu features spices strongly associated with the Middle East, uh, such as a generous amount of cumin, black pepper. Mantus are typically served with a minty yogurt sauce popular about Throughout Central Asia, mantus have uh, numerous regional variations. In Afghanistan, they are sometimes filled with cooked meat and served with kormas made of lentils and diced carrots. Uzbek mantus are filled with meat and onions. Tradition requires that their size be no bigger than the center of the palm of your hand. A favorite dish among the Turks is manta, which are very tiny dumplings, sometimes called um, chichwara, the Uzbeks called chichwara, but tied up like tortellini. Um, so we have this tradition where Marco Polo and Kubla Khan met, and somehow these foods kind of uh, transferred along. Um, there is a Turkic palimpsest, palimpsest in uh, southern Brooklyn when I came in the 1980s and grew up there. Um, by name alone, Sheepshead Bay sounds like an ideal culinary location for Central Asia nostalgic for lamb's head soup of their homeland. In truth, the neighborhoods was named for the once abundant sheep's head fish. It is for the most, it was for the most part, Italian, Irish, and Jewish neighborhoods separated by a bridge from Manhattan Beach, a wealthier neighborhood. The majority of Central Asians who now reside there sought out East Southern Brooklyn through word of mouth from earlier Turkic immigrants. Sheepshead Bay was my childhood neighborhood. I grew up there in a small pocket of vibrant and varied Central Asians. This community expanded as an older, more established community of Turks and Tatars, befriended newly arriving Afghan Uzbeks, helping them find work as supers in apartment buildings on Ocean Avenue, of course, um, from... Uh, 
uh, and also uh, in other parts of uh, Brooklyn and Queens as well. Uh, over time, these new arrivals found work as framers in frame shops, rug dealers, and neighborhood shopkeepers. The commonalities of the Turkic languages kept our connections strong. During the 1980s and 90s, in an expression of unity, various Turkish, Turkic language groups gathered to march together in a pan-Turkic spirit at the Turkey Day Parade under a common red and white uh, star crescent flag. This was quite controversial controversial because many Turkic people felt loyal to their particular Kazakh, Uzbek, and Afghan flags, but the collective need for a communal celebration and protection and social networks uh, proved more urgent. So uh, for the most part, the passing was as Turkish instead of as Uzbek or as Kazakh or as Uyghur. It made it uh, sort of more digestible in a sense, if we can say. Um, but actually, the very first uh, Central Asian organization actually was founded in 1927 um, by Central Asian Turks who had come through Turkey. And this was a mosque that was built in, um, uh, where is it? Yeah, in Flushing, Queens, actually, uh, 1927. And it included, um, it wasn't limited just to Turkic people. It actually included African Muslims, uh, Arab Muslims, and others who were there in the area. Um, 1944 to 1947 is where you get the influx of um, Central or Eurasian Turks in Sheepshead Bay, Southern Brooklyn, um, after the uh, deportation and genocide of Crimean Tatars, those who fled came to uh, Brooklyn, to Sheepshead Bay, mainly because it captured that um, feeling of uh, Crimea, in a sense, because it's right by the water, and there's a lot of restaurants right by the water as well. Uh, 1964, the American Tatar Association opened up an office, first in Flushing, Queens, and then sort of, uh, but the large majority of the community started moving into Sheepshead Bay. Um, after this, you had, um, let's see. Um, this was an important year. 1964 was actually important for many Turkic people migrating, not only from Turkey, but for Central Asia as well. Um, there was some uh, immigration quota, which I never did the research for, but this is all, again, word of mouth through stories of elders. Uh, at the time, um, my father and his father had fled Afghanistan more for... Um, uh, family issues, not so much as um, uh, national issues as, as Afghans are fleeing now. If you, um, So uh, they had come to Karachi, Pakistan, waiting for word that would grant them entry into the United States. Uh, this was the same time that many Central Asians had fled um, from Soviet era, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and um, not so much Turkmenistan, but you had a lot of Uzbek and Kazakh uh, immigrants, Uyghurs, who had come to Karachi in Pakistan and were waiting to take a boat to the U.S. And it, they were granted um, sort of a group, um, I don't know if it was a lottery, but as there, suddenly there was a access and um, sympathy for those fleeing the Soviet Union to come to the U.S. Of course, immigration laws have changed in 1964. Uh, there's much more diversity in 1965. So this is the time that my father originally was going to come to the U.S. Uh, in Karachi, he witnessed waves of Uzbeks, Kazakhs, Uyghurs living in Turkestan Anjuman, a community housing center in Kar Karachi. They were all biding their time waiting. Uh, my father finally ended up coming um, uh, to leave, but my grandfather had actually passed away. Uh, so he went back to Afghanistan. Uh, my father came in 1980, and he came very much like the majority of Afghan Uzbek immigrants at the time with family in tow. The $1 bill and the quarter he once received as a tip while working as a waiter at Tawana House in Karachi are now framed and serve as homage to the dream of a teenager who once wished he could come to America with his father. Thank you so much, Professor Syed, and in particular for bringing in the senses of smell and taste, to quote you, the gastronomic te testimony of a nomadic past. Those of you who have read Lisa Lowe's Intimacies of Four Continents will find echoes of that in Professor Syed's presentation, talking about cotton in the United States and how that connects to potatoes in Central Asia and how that connects to food in other parts of Asia and Europe. Um, and you will be hearing about Lisa Lowe's impressive scholarship throughout the entire week and the ways that it connects Asia, Africa, Europe, and the Americas, as well as the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, and 21st centuries. But for 
today, with the theme of providing context for Asian American experiences, Professor Lowe is going to share a little bit about her personal background and her family's American story. I know that we're coming up on the end of the technical class and that students who need to go to another class might need to log off, um, but we're going to keep our speakers for a bit longer. So we are opening up the chat. You can start adding in your comments and questions while Professor Lowe shares with us. Thank you, uh, Professor King. It's a pleasure to be invited to Brooklyn College this week. Um, though I currently teach at Yale University, I, I taught in the University of California, a great public university for over 25 years. And I'm deeply committed to public education and to affordable access to higher education for all. So um, it's really an honor, a special honor to be invited to spend the week, even if virtually, at Brooklyn College. Thank you, George Stonefish, for the beautiful prayer and acknowledgement of the Lenape people. And I would also like to express gratitude to the Kinpiak, Pequot, and Mohegan peoples, the traditional caretakers of the land on which I work, and the Wampanoag, Nar Narragansett, Nipmuc, and Massachusetts people on whose land I live. Thank you, President Anderson. Professor King, Anthony Bianco, the Wolf Institute and the Hess family for the hospitality. And also thank you to Reverend Wong, Vivian Trong and Zora Seed for their rich comments, providing this crucial background for understanding the histories of East Asian, Southeast Asian and Central Asian immigrant communities in Brooklyn. I've of course worked on earlier histories of Asian immigration to the US from the 19th century to the 1980s. And I noticed some themes and conditions affecting Asian Americans in Brooklyn that resonate with this longer history. So I just wanted to mention a few of them before talking a bit about my own family's history. Um, Asians and Asian Americans, of course, have a long history of being treated as alien and considered perpetual foreigners and have been subjected to anti-Asian violence as, as Vivian has explained to us. Um, Asians have been targeted as national threats in periods of domestic, economic and political instability and when the, the US was at war with Asia in Asian countries for most of the 20th century in the Philippines, Korea, and in Vietnam. In this way, the anti-Asian racism we're witnessing just in the last several years um, or in the period that, of the 1980s that was discussed by Vivian is not new as she has made clear. Um, the late 19th century, for example, was also a period of political and economic crisis. After the abolition of slavery, as the US is transforming its slavery-based cotton, cotton economy in the US South to one of transcontinental industrial production. This is a period of economic expansion that required the enclosure and forced relocation of native peoples and the seizure of their lands and the mining of metals and the building of railroads to which Chinese labor was central. Anti-Chinese racism expressed itself in white vigilante mobs assaulting, burning, even lynching the Chinese as Beth Lou Williams has recently described in her book, The Chinese Must Go. And this resulted in 1875 in the Page Act uh, to quote, end the danger of cheap Chinese labor and immoral Chinese women. Um, and the Page Law defined any Chinese woman as a prostitute and any Chinese man as a coolie, restricting further immigration. Um, by 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act was the first federal law to bar a racial or national origin group from immigrating to the US. Later exclusion acts have all modeled themselves on this 1882 law, including the subsequent immigration exclusions of other Asian groups from Japan, Korea, the Philippines, and South Asia. <clears throat> Um, as we know, of course, East Asians were only one of the many groups to have been racialized as non-white and then suspected to be wartime racial enemies. And as Mustafa Bayoumi has observed, the treatment of Arab, Muslim, South Asian, Central Asians after 9-11 can be said to resemble this earlier treatment of Japanese Americans who were incarcerated in World War II. And of course, the stereotype of Asians as diseased isn't new either. Long before Trump called COVID the China virus, there was a colonial history of Asians being constructed as diseased. 
China was called the sick man of Asia in the 19th century, followed chi following China's losses during the Opium Wars. And from the 18th century, Europeans and Americans mistakenly believed China to be the origin of smallpox, even though as early as the 17th century, Imperial Manchu had quite advanced techniques for inoculating against smallpox. Asians have continuously been posed against other racialized groups, particularly African-Americans. But as Vivian's paper makes clear, there are long histories of Asians involved in cross-racial social movements against police violence for social justice and redistribution of resources for housing, education, and community development. We often think of the stereotype of Asian Americans as the model minority as beginning in the 1980s, but long before, since the 18th and 19th centuries, British, Dutch, and Spanish colonial administrators construct the Chinese in opposition, particularly to enslaved Africans. As Vivian has told us, the current invocation of anti-Asian violence to justify more policing doesn't help Asians who have a long history of being subjected to police violence and cross-racial coalition continues to be as important today as it was in the past in order to grapple with our linked histories. We also know there's an extraordinary amount of heterogeneity within the broad category Asian American. An intersectional analysis is necessary in order to account for different and complicated disparities among different Asian American groups, different national origins, generations, citizens and non-citizens, different class, gender, sexual, religious identities, and so forth. An undocumented refugee woman working in low wage labor, a queer Filipino sex worker are much more vulnerable than an elite Taiwanese businessman, for example. And not only must we think intersectionally to forge cross-racial solidarities, we must always think internationally as well. For Asian Americans and Asian diaspora, we, who often maintain family attachments, bicultural identifications and transnational connections, it should be clear how race in America is connected to what's happening in Asia. For example, Taiwan-based scholar Chen Ting Lin observes how during COVID, Chineseness has been racialized in Taiwan, Singapore, and other Asian sites, activating an older legacy of the US influence in Asia during the Cold War. That is US client nations in Asia allied with American anti-communism against the People's Republic of China. And Lin observes that now the so-called Wuhan virus has reactivated anti-communism or anti-PRC sentiment in Taiwan, and it's being used as a justification to bar Chinese students from the PRC from entering Taiwan, even though ethnic Chinese from Hong Kong and Macau have been welcomed there. Older stereotypes of Chinese bodies as diseased have been revived in Taiwan to articulate anti-communist feelings from the Cold War. As Chen Ting Lin says, quote, the Cold War has never been a local event. It's a global phenomenon, but with very regional implications, unquote. In other words, the Cold War continues to inflect inter-Asian relations and the US relation to Asian states and societies in turn affects Asian racialization among Asian Americans in the, in the US. Heterogeneity among Asians includes regional sites of racial formation and one's immigration history, the conditions for one's immigration, the number of generations you are here from the immigrant generation really is uh, decisive in what your experience of being Asian American is. My own parents immigrated from China in 1945 during World War II. And at 15, 14, ages 14 and 15, they were both children really sent by their parents to attend boarding schools in the US to keep them safe from the upheavals of World War II. This was just shortly after the 1943 Magnuson Act, which included a provision uh, you know, which ended the bar to Chinese immigration, but also permitted a quota of 100 immigrants per year. I grew up in Pasadena in the greater Los Angeles area, which in 1970 was the first city school district ordered to desegregate by busing by the Supreme Court. And I was a student on the school district committee to design the busing plan in Pasadena. 
The 1960s and 70s were a time of dynamic organizing against racism and segregation in housing, education, and work for immigrant communities in the Los Angeles area. My sister, Lydia Lowe, has been a labor and community organizer since that time, first in Oakland and San Francisco, and then in New York and Boston Chinatowns. For many years, she directed the Chinese Progressive Association in Boston, which organizes hotel and restaurant workers and builds strength as workers providing community services, services for the Chinatown community. And now she works on the Chinatown Community Land Trust, through which Chinatown residents and activists are struggling for bit greater control on development and housing in Boston. I went to college and graduate school in California, where students demanded Asian American studies and other ethnic studies in the 1960s and 70s. Asian American studies began at UCLA, UC Berkeley, and San Francisco, uh, San Francisco State in 1969. I myself was a part of a collective group that established Asian American studies and ethnic studies at UC San Diego in the early 1980s. At this point, right now, all of the University of California and California State University campuses have Asian American studies or ethnic studies programs and departments. When I moved to the Northeast uh, about nine years ago, I was surprised to discover that the provisions for Asian American studies um, are sparser here, despite the historical and contemporary importance of Asians in New York City and Brooklyn and throughout the Eastern Seaboard. So I was very heartened to hear from President Anderson this morning that Brooklyn College is taking steps to have a curricula in Asian American history, literature, and culture. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I want everybody to give our virtual applause and then take your fingers and type your comments and questions into the chat. Such a rich and varied um, presentations that we've had today. Thank you to all of the speakers. And uh, Randy, if you could bring back and pin um, the speakers for us to um, talk to each other. And while people are typing into the chat, and you can also feel free if you want to type one thing that you learned today, that's also a really great way to engage. While we're waiting for a question to come in, you can also raise your hand if you want to if you want to unmute and ask a question. I would love for the speakers, if you have any reflections on each other's presentations or a question for each other, I just want to give a moment for that. It was amazing. <laughs> um, but also to have it all contextualized um, and to see how much uh, academic work is also activist work as well. So I think that's what um, I'm going to leave with today. It's quite powerful. Thank you for all that. Thank you. It's such an honor. Just, just to echo those comments, I really appreciate all the, the comments today. And um, I think Professor Sayed, um, your uh, contextualization of the Central Asian migration to uh, Southern Brooklyn um, was just something that I, um, you know, had not really known uh, despite having grown up around the neighborhood. So I, I really appreciate um, all of your, your comments. And all of the background on food cultures was fascinating and made me hungry. <laughs> Yeah, so I was saying I want to be along on those res on that research, right? <laughs> you know, all of that food. One of the things that I thought was great, Professor Lowe, about how you ended is that you know we're Brooklyn College, we're part of the City University of New York. We are a public institution, and so the students who are watching this are probably most of them went to public schools. They're now at a public college, and for you to talk about the trajectory of your own life and of others in your family, I think that that also connects to what Professors Trong and Syed were saying in terms of what we think of as capital H history, as something that happens out there, right, and other people are involved in, is actually very intimately connected to what we as individuals do in our kitchens, in our, you know, in our own office, our home offices, and in, in every aspect of our lives. And so I'm curious if maybe as a takeaway, each of you might ha have something to say directly to our students about their ability to change the world to be a little bit corny about it but that's why I'm a teacher is I think that I can guide people to help change the world
That's a large question. <laughs> but I think, you know, uh, um, I mean, let me just say again, I'm really amazed by the kinds of conversations you've organized for the week. And one of them is on pedagogy uh, later this afternoon, um, which kind of overlaps with what you're asking about. And I do think that, you know, one of the things um, I've really learned in 35 years of teaching and, and most recently teaching um, incarcerated students um, is that, um, you know, we really have to give up this idea that when we teach where the professor has the knowledge and it's going one direction to the students. In fact, there's so much knowledge that resides in lived experience that students bring to the table. And I really, I really enjoy having a kind of multi-centered, have teaching be a multi-centered conversation in which knowledge comes in lots of different forms. Um, so people's immigration histories are really important resources for learning, um, learning from their peers, learning from one another, but also teaching the professor themselves. Thank you. And as I, we do have a question um, from the chat, so you can, in addition to my very large question, you can address Professor Mencia's very large question. Um, being in America and given the experiences and expertise of the panelists, I know that we're focusing on Asian American experiences, but can anyone also briefly talk about Asian diasporas globally and whether there are any interesting comparison or contrast between Asian American experiences and other Asian diasporic experiences? So you can feel free to address either of those questions. Is that something you would like to answer, Vivian? Um, I'm not sure if I can uh, speak with much expertise on other um, Asian diasporas beyond um, Asian American experiences, but I guess to um, start to answer the, the question that Professor King posed, I think both in terms of um, the history and the um, the changing the world. I think one of the, um, you know, the pieces of advice that I always give students is that it, it starts where you are um, mm -hmm. and to um, really kind of think about um, how your own knowledge is uh, situated with, within your own experiences and to, um, you know, in terms of uh, reaching out uh, to um, get involved in, in activism to really just start kind of showing up um, to, to organizations and to um, to build with um, the various communities where you are. So uh, that's good. So. Thanks. Um, to answer, to try to take a uh, stab at Lauren Mancia's question, I mean, I think um, what we know is that the, you know, at, in the mid 19th century is when you really have a massive exodus uh, from China and, and global migration around the world and also to other parts of Asia. And, you know, this had to do with, um, you know, famine, wars, the opium wars, um, lots of different kinds of upheavals that dislocated people. And, and the Asian diaspora globally um, meant that Asians needed to enter a society that already had a social hierarchy and oftentimes they did agricultural labor, but sometimes they became small business people or traders in, you know, small goods. But, um, you know, I think they're the, the uh, Asian Americans who came and worked in mining and the railroad and so forth in the 19th century um, and in farming and small businesses in the early 20th century. Um, you know, have parallels with Asian migrants elsewhere in the West Indies and the Caribbean, in Latin America, um, and, and elsewhere in Asia. If and when we get our Asian American Studies program, um, I have a class called Race and Ethnicity in the Caribbean that looks very deeply at the indenture experience in the Asian diaspora of the Caribbean as represented through literature. So stay tuned. Um, Professor Syed, would you like to give kind of a closing comment on any of these questions? 
Um, there's so much for uh, Central Asians, the diaspora. I was thinking of what diaspora meant and how that connects us. It is mostly a um, 80s, 90s, and uh, 2000s. Um, and now recent with new Afghan refugees coming in. So um, you do have that sense of um, connection and communication a little more either through letters early on to, um, you know, this connection of war that is what dispersed uh, and created the diaspora or, um, you know, sort of a, a civil infrastructure sort of breaking apart, which is what happened post-Soviet Union um, that happened in Central Asia. So you have those connections that, uh, and language becomes so much more important to preserve and maintain and, and sort of connect around that. So there's a lot of politics of language and, and preservation in that sense, as far as identity building within the communities in the diaspora. Um, but I would say just to go back to the, the kitchen, which is where I always feel like I learn um, or record. Um, for You said something about how, what do we tell our students about maintaining their history? Oral history is very important. Um, recording, writing, um, bringing, bringing it to publishing the best way you can. When I, we were, we started out, we started out as sort of like zines. So um, just publish it and get it out. And of course, you know, um, uh, they are now preserved. And I think it's in Brooklyn College have a zine library. So we had all, thanks to Alicia, we have all of our, um, you know, early attempts at trying to put our stories to print on record now. So um, I would say write and interview and collect and hoard those stories because that's really how you um, shape. And, and that and is a wonderful segue. Thank you, Professor Syed, because we actually have an event that is featuring students sharing their explorations of oral histories and into the archives of Asian Americans at Brooklyn College. And Professor Cherry Lusa, I see, I see your question in the chat and I'm gonna ask Professor Lowe to address that in the next event, which is Asian American Studies 101. It's a question about Professor Lowe's own activism as a student in the 70s. And I was fascinated by this history that even as a high school student, you were involved in, um, I, I think it was a high school student or college student in desegregation. So that explains, a bit about who you are as a scholar, um, and perhaps you can address that in that conversation. And how old I am, too. <laughs> <laughs> and how fabulous you look. Uh, but between your conversation with our own Professor Mustafa Bayoumi, which is the next event. So all of the events are free and open to the public. Please continue to register for them and share on your social media, hashtag S2021. Um, and thank you again to all of our speakers for a really amazing and wonderful introduction to the week, setting out so many of the issues that we're going to continue to address. And thank you, everyone. We'll see you at the next event.